I told Jonathan he was going to have to start singing those songs that require a lot of diaphragm and breath support for earlier in the service before I have to get up here and breathe. <laughs> we are continuing our study of evolution. And one thing I wanted to say, I mentioned him twice already. I've been, <clears throat> before I get to that, I've been referring to a lot of the fellows who were scientists and so forth back when I was a young person and a young adult, how they were quoted. I did that to show there's been no change from back then for those who wanted to know the facts in the matter from those today who want to know the facts in the matter. Now you can come up with all sorts of quibbles as I was taught a long time ago no matter how well you prove your point, you cannot stop error from quibbling. There will always be people that quibble. But there are some people, and I want to make sure how I say this, today and for some time now, who are dealing with origins, who are, to say the least, top-notch scientists in various fields. One, you've heard me mention, Dr. James Tour from Rice University. He's not, you've got to realize the fellows I'm mentioning are not just people who earned a Ph.D., which says a lot. It says a whole lot. And very knowledgeable in their field and have spent their years teaching in a given field. Dr. Tour has, I don't know how many patents, and hundreds of patents still pending, He's written hundreds and hundreds of published papers in his field. He's run all kinds of awards. And uh, he was chosen, and I've forgotten now, not long ago, not too long ago, as like one of the top 40 scientists in the whole world. So I'm talking about that kind of person. But I'm also wanting to caution you here, these are not New Testament Christians. They do not understand the right division of the word. And they're just as denominational they could be. But when they are speaking from the standpoint of origins and what science can and cannot do, then they have a lot to offer. But just because they're doing a real good job, don't put your own brain in your own back pocket and don't do any thinking. There's also, he's an elderly man now, even older than Ken and I, <laughs> Dr. John Lennox, who is... Uh, emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford University. <laughs> he has done a great job. In fact, just recently I mentioned this morning that Tour and Linux were together just recently along with Dr. William Lane Craig in Houston just the last couple of weeks. And uh, Linux was celebrating his uh, 80th birthday and probably his last trip to the United States. Again, I do not hesitate in a lot of ways to recommend the great amount that they say when it comes to proofs on the existence of God and things like that. Now, when it comes to Craig, he holds some views on the creation and such that uh, I just don't think are right at all. Yet on his uh, proofs for the existence of God are tremendous in a lot of ways. I am going to preach a sermon about one thing he does. It's just as off base as it can be and typical of the denominationalist. And uh, I'll wait and hold that for you later on. Uh, I've been looking at that and thinking about doing it for a good while. Now, Linux, some of you, if you don't read after these fellows over the years, these are strange names to you, but the late, late Dr. Christopher Hitchens, one of the foremost atheists of his time, still is as far as what he's put out and what's published, uh, debated uh, uh, Dr. Lennox and didn't fare too well. And then we've all heard, or most of us have, of, of Richard Dawkins, also of Oxford. And uh, he's the one that wrote The God Delusion. Uh, he also debated Dr. Lennox, and Lennox did a great job with him. And all of these fellows recently were together. Uh, 
Stephen Johnson wrote me a note about that about a week ago, and I had seen that, Stephen. <laughs> I'd noticed that. But you've got to be grounded. Let me underscore the word grounded in the fundamentals before you just swallow everything anybody says. Uh, but I, I would say these fellows on most of the fundamentals are pretty, pretty straight. Uh, but when it comes to what must I do to be saved from my sins, anything pertaining to the church, its organization, its work, its worships, all of that, they don't know any more than the next person next door. They would accept the denominational concept of the church. And they would say anybody that believes in Christ, the Son of God, and ask him to be uh, their Savior, that would be all right. Uh, Dr. Tour, I think, is a member of, well, one of the Baptist churches down in town. Very interesting to, to hear these fellows speak because they are speaking from a background where you usually don't hear people that have that kind of scholarly, academic training. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there today in various fields that have a PhD, and that's nothing to sneeze at. If you earn a PhD from anything they put you through the ringer before they're going to let you have it because when you go out with that on your name having received it from whatever school that is they don't want, they don't want you to be an embarrassment to them in fact they start that process from the time they interview you to become a part of a given doctoral program and then they have ways of weeding that out all the way down through there so i'm just simply saying there is a lot of good there there's a lot of good out there but for the faithful member of the church of Christ, a Christian, and that's all we are, going by the authority of the New Testament in the right divided word, you need to use your mind to think with and to consider these things and be sure. Now, I was mentioning last week on the matter of, of evolution the limitations of the scientific method, and I won't repeat some of those. Um, but there are limitations. And it's interesting that uh, Dr. Lennox wrote his last book, I believe his last one, was Can Science Explain Everything? And of course he's pointing out that science cannot explain everything because it's not meant to explain everything. I think I covered this last week. The scientific method, number one, is limited to what can be observed with the five senses. Number two, the scientific method is limited to the present. And of course, it would have to be if you're examining it through the five senses. That would be sight, smell, hearing, taste, touching. Number three, science is amoral which means it's not moral. Never do scientific discoveries tell you that this is morally right or it's morally wrong. You can take many scientific discoveries. The person who is subject to a moral code and use it in an immoral way or in a moral way so that's an important matter. I think I used, I mentioned this before, uh, like radiation can be used for good things. But it's not very good when it comes to hydrogen bomb <laughs> when it's dropped on something. I wouldn't call it good at all as far as ultimately what it does. The fourth point is the scientific method is limited to telling us how limited to telling us how a process works. But it cannot tell us why. It tells us how, but cannot tell us why. And the fifth one is the scientific method is limited in that it cannot deal with the unique. Dr. Paul Wise, who I quoted earlier in one of the sermons, had this to say, quote, one-time events on earth are outside of science. Science simply cannot deal with anything that is unique. The quote was, one-time events on earth are outside of science. 
For science to deal with it, it must have four traits, and this is important. In fact, if you were going to study chemistry or physics or whatever it might be in the area of the sciences, you would need to know these things if you're to be able to successfully work in the field of science. First of all, it must be timeless. Number two, it must be repeatable at will. It must be three, universal. And four, it must be dependable. One of the most important things to you personally is not even scientific. Stop and think about your birth for just a minute. And I thought this was rather unique a long time ago when I found it. He says, your birth is not even scientific. Was it timeless? No. Was it repeatable at will? No. Was it dependable? Ask your mother. No. So you see, your birth is not even scientific. Yet to you, it's extremely important. For without it, you wouldn't be here today. Further, I suggest, in keeping with this statement, that science does not have all the answers. That most of the things you hold dear and cherish the most are not even scientific. He cites, or at least one place I noticed, there are various things I've noted cited, but one of them was the Magna Carta, which was signed in 1215. If you don't know what that is, uh, you just have to go look it up. Magna Carta, M-A-G-N-A, capital C-A-R-T-A, 1215 in England. Another one, the drafting and signing of the Declaration of Independence in 70, 1776. The forming of the Constitution of the United States of America in 1789 with its Bill of Rights, 1791, and so on we could go. Most of the truly valued things in this world are not scientific. Now, we've mentioned these things to say this. Evolution is not scientific and cannot be proven as a fact of science. If you don't understand what a fact is, get a dictionary. That's what they exist for and look up F-A-C-T. How do I come to the truth about a matter? I gather up all the relevant facts pertaining to the matter. And from those, I conclude the truth about it. And frankly, that's the way our justice system works and the way the court system works. <laughs> just listen to Joe Friday on the real old Dragnet show. Facts, ma'am, just facts. We laugh at that, but that's exactly what's going on. If you're going to get to the truth of the matter, you have to have the facts in the matter together to get the truth of it. Now, that's the reason scientists may gather the facts that his uh, scientific ability at the time allows him to examine. But later on, things are discovered as the years go by that allows him maybe to gather other facts that were not available to him in the first gathering. And so he puts all those together and has to change his view, if he's honest. Now, let me ask, just think of one being here, who was present, according to the evolutionists, 4.5 billion years ago? That's the evolutionist timetable. They may have altered that some, but it's, it's sort of like a national debt. Who can comprehend 4.5 billion anyway? <laughs> and our national debt's in the trillions. Who was there 4.5 billion years ago to observe what happened? And if it's to be scientific, that particular event must be repeatable at will or it does not fit the scientific method. Well, we say, is it? And we answer, certainly not. Whatever happened at the moment, the very moment of creation, is not testable or verifiable 
by science and the method in which and by which it works. So scientifically speaking, underscore that, scientifically speaking, both evolution and creation must remain only theories as far as the scientific matters are concerned. That's the reason I said scientifically speaking. Evolution, therefore, is not. It is not a fact of science. But look around you. It's taught as that. I, I should have brought this down, but I have my library a book I picked up some years ago from a University of California, or not a university in California, textbook, in which is the textbook is for a course on teaching evolution. Now, does that begin to tell you that there are those scientists who aren't content to remain within their own scientific method? But when they step out of the present and the rest of the scientific method, they've left science. They've now entered into the area of philosophy and or religion. And that's really where it should be. I mentioned, I think, the first time I started on this a couple of weeks ago that uh, there was this group that got together on both sides of the matter, creation, evolution, but Lone Star several years ago. And one of the professors was an older man who was in a, something to do with, with the University of Houston in their uh, science department. I forgot what he taught. But he came right out and stated this should not be discussed among scientists. It's not a scientific question. But I don't know. I sat there that night. Now, and no, I didn't seem to impress anybody. So even though evolution has not been proven true, guess what? There are many people who are under the impression that evolution is true. Let me make this observation and you take it for what it's worth because I've seen it happen over and over again in my lifetime some people don't think anybody has ever studied or discovered anything until they do and they don't understand that there are people who have years before they ever discovered America or anywhere else on this earth had spent a great deal of time studying a lot of this And yet they come up and say, look at what I found. You didn't know that, did you? Yes. That and a whole lot more a long time ago. Belief in organic evolution, of course, is very popular. Dr. R. L. Wesson stated in his book, The Creation Evolutionary or Evolution Controversy, he said this, and I quote, It is downright hard to find anyone who does not believe in evolution in one form or another. And that's true. I would say just in the Houston area, my, we'll carry it out to University of Sam Houston, out that far, all the way around us. If you were to go into the science departments and have the right kind of questionnaire so you could get them to answer straightforward factually to the point, they, they, would, they would say, yes, it is a proven thing. We think because somebody is highly, highly educated in a given particular field, and they may know more about it than some of us and a lot of other folks may ever know about it, that they can never be questioned that they must have covered it all and, and uh, they must know everything about it. Well, you can find out pretty quick if you have the right questions. And I might suggest this to you. Most of the time, if we will speak up on anything when we know the truth of it, and somebody else is speaking error concerning it, most of the time we want to just really, if we do anything, there's not enough of this, we want to get right with them. But I'll tell you, one of the best things in the world, and our Lord exemplified it for you, is just ask questions and learn to ask those questions. I could not, not that I'm a professional at it, I could not tell you the times over the years that I've just sat down in my study 
and written true, false questions. I couldn't tell you how many. I ran across those. When Jody finally got me to clean up back here several months ago, my uh, manhole, I think she's really afraid of me to clean it up for what I'd find down there or what I might disappear down there. Anyway, I did, and I, I had forgotten about a whole folder full of questions. I don't know how many there were that I had just written out. I'm not doing something that only I can do. I'm saying that's what everybody ought to do. And everybody's capable of doing it. Just ask the right questions. Jesus asked the Jews of his day, and look what a quandary he put them in. Whose son is the Messiah? And I'm paraphrasing. Whose son is he? Now you go find that and see what a quandary it threw the Jews into, all because of their false concepts of things. And you can do that with people. And I've done it various ones in dealing with them. There was somebody that decided to remark on something I published in Facebook the last day or so. And I just asked him several questions. I'm anxious to see what he's going to do. Because most of the time, people don't like questions. A fellow by the name of Conway Zirkel once stated that, quote, practically every educated man believes in evolution. Evolution is incorporated in the thinking of our time, unquote. I think that's true as far as what he's saying in his observation. It doesn't mean that it's the case that they're really educated people. Have you ever defined education? What does it mean to be an educated person? Think about it. What does it mean to be educated? My grandfather, my mother's dad, got through the eighth grade. But I can tell you one thing. Back in the early 20th century and 19th century, the way schools were taught, if you really learned first through the eighth grade, you were pretty well fitted for whatever society had to offer because you knew reading and writing and arithmetic. You also knew talk to the tune of a hickory stick. But and so it is. Belief in evolution is just the thing. When you're dealing with these things, these little fundamental matters are important. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount declared, the corrupt tree bringeth forth forth evil fruit Matthew seven seventeen. the corrupt tree bringing forth evil fruit now nowhere has this eternal truth been more tragically demonstrated than in a survey of the evils resultant from the theory of organic evolution I don't think very highly of George Bernard Shaw He's been dead for a long, long time now, but very uh, great reputation in his writing and so forth of 70, 80 years ago. He said this, that, quote, the world jumped at Darwin, unquote, in hopes of ridding itself of the idea of God. And Sir Julian Huxley, grandson of the famous Darwinian advocate Sir Thomas Huxley, said this, quote, and I think, in fact, I know so. If you look up Julian Huxley on YouTube, he's a very old man, but you can hear him speaking on certain things uh, in the 1950s. He said this, Darwinism, or Darwinianism, remove the whole idea of God as the creator of organisms from the sphere of rational discussion, unquote. Then the atheist... Uh, Bertram Russell, he wrote a little book of why I'm not a Christian. He really ended up claiming to be an agnostic. He's one of those, I'd like to be an atheist, but I've got too many problems, so I'll just be an agnostic and act like an atheist. He said that sin is no longer a desirable notion. Quote, unquote. And Aldous Huxley remarked that, quote, God is not a youthful hypothesis. The fruits of such stupidity have been bitter indeed because these thoughts from these great men who influenced so many people in academia 
begin to permeate into the whole of it and form all sorts of things. When I was, the, usually a doctorate program as far as the uh, class part of it, have certain key courses to where they say, if you don't get anything out of this, you're going to get this. <laughs> so, so they make them very hard. When I first took my first semester, I had to take a study of the history and it had to do with the philosophers of education. A lot of these fellows were back there. And if you study so many different disciplines, it's like a funnel. It brings you right back down. And only a few, comparatively speaking, people, and they're all the same people, influence the thinking of a whole big scope up here at the top. If you study psychology, you'll find out some of the people that are noted for certain views of psychology are the same ones that impacted sociology. And so on it goes. So these philosophies, these ideas, these approaches, methods, if you'll call them that, guide the thinking of a whole lot of people who are highly educated in a whole lot of different areas. The fruits then that we see born out today come from people embracing this and trying to apply it to their own discipline. Uh, you'll find something interesting. You just study what the Nazis did in studying evolution. And guess what? The survival of the fittest suited them just fine. And they didn't consider the Jews and others to be fit. And they considered themselves the Aryan Fuhrer Superman. But the others were to mention, and thus they didn't deserve to live. So I'm simply saying to parents and to everybody, it's long past waking up. But when we're so involved with things around us, this is the everyday get up and go and whatever, take them down to school, that's their job, that's not mine, and all this kind of thing. Just expect what that kind of thing gets, what you get from that kind of viewpoint and application. Children are taught that no God is responsible for what we see around us. They don't have to come out and just say that explicitly. That isn't just so many words, but they can say it in all sorts of other ways. They'll try to teach that everything is the result of natural forces at work in the universe. As you know, they teach that man is just an accident of a system that did not have him in mind when it started or anything else in mind. No purpose to it. So they've come up with this. Now, I guess right now I need to pause and say, have you forgotten the turtle on top of the fence post? <laughs> I don't care how adept you become and how educated you get. Don't forget that turtle on top of the fence post. Now don't get it mixed up and say lizard on top of the fence post. Because <laughs> a lizard of itself, in the very nature of a lizard, can climb a fence post. <laughs> But that can't be said of a turtle. And then realize what that turtle on top of the fence post implies about it getting there. And that's about as simple as you can make it. Evolution being true and God being by necessity ruled out, look around you and you see what happens. Young people are smart enough to figure out exactly what that means. No God, no law. Now, it doesn't take a person with an earned doctorate to know that. The atheist Jean-Paul Sartre, the Frenchman, so well said, if there is no God, everything is permitted, unquote. And our young people don't have to be the eminent type person this French philosopher was, as far as his notoriety, to catch on to that simple fact. You could start, I think you'd be surprised, you could start with a four-year-old 
and just start pointing out there's no God. I pointed out this morning that when the communists took over Cuba, Fidel Castro's soldiers were coming to a classroom of first grader type age, have them bow down and say, pray to God for candy. It wouldn't be any candy when they got through, but then they'd say, pray to, pray to Fidel Castro for candy. And as their heads would bow, their eyes closed, the soldiers put candy on there. Now raise your head. What have you got? Candy. You, oh, no, they wouldn't believe that. Have you ever dealt with the little children? Little Johnny or little Susie or little whoever comes up to the Bible school teacher one day and remarks, Teacher, we were taught last week in school that man evolved from eight black ancestors. Is that really true? And the teacher in consternation turns and yells at little Johnny or little Susie, Don't you know the Bible says God did it? And that says it right there, doesn't it? That's not the approach. Well, let's uh, get on with our lesson about Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. This in turn makes the child feel ignorant and stupid. And why should I ask any more questions? In reality, it's nothing but a, de but a defense mechanism that we bar and use all too often for a lazy, shiftless teacher who simply isn't willing to put the time and effort in to learn the things that teach biblical creation and refutes all sorts of stuff pertaining to evolution. Or maybe little Johnny or little Susie comes up to the Bible school teacher and they, one or the other of them, might be a whole class, I don't know, <laughs> remarks, teacher, we were taught last week in school that men evolved from eight black ancestors. Is that really true? And the teacher turned and yells at little Johnny or little Susie, don't you know we don't talk about things like that in Bible class? That's no answer. That's the place it ought to be talked about. But let me pause here and say this. If you're waiting for the teaching that a child needs to be done totally by the Bible class teacher or the preacher from the pulpit, and you're unwilling as parents to do it, or at least take them to somebody that can, then you're just not doing what God put you here on this earth to do. You're abdicating your responsibility. You know, one of the things that was emphasized, I was quite pleased that it was so many years ago in taking these courses on the history of uh, education in the United States was the fact that our government back then, when it was being formed, the same folks put together our Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and so on, did not have an educational ministry. Have you ever noticed that? Now, we have a Department of Education, but it came in much later on. And what they were concerned about was taking the education of children out from under the responsibility of their parents. Thus, you have local, all over the country, you have local school districts, supposedly, so that the people of that school district can vote in the people who manage that school and hire the administrators and so forth. But then to get around that, the federal government comes up with all kinds of giveaway money. And, of course, that'll get you if you don't get it any other way. And the more of it you spend, the more of it you may be able to get. I know for a long time ago, before I knew anything about what I'm talking about now, that when I was in school those many, many years ago, the superintendent who was there when I was there, was even there when my parents were there, would do his best to spend every penny, however much it was, that came from the federal government because he knew that he wouldn't get as much the next year if he didn't spend some of it. Well, now, tell me what that leads to. So the Department of Education begins to put out their money, but if you don't toll the mark on the federal government's viewpoint of stuff, you don't get that money. Well, people love money so much, they're going to toll the mark. 
And so they do. And so what the founding fathers didn't do and didn't want to do through the Department of Education, they do. Through money, by making it available, but you can't have this money if you don't conform to our guidelines. People don't look beyond. You think most parents know about that? And I guarantee you, if you had a public high school or any part of the school that were to start teaching strongly, all the teachers were teaching strongly against evolution and all that implies in teaching uh, creation, or at least teaching them both as hypotheses and not being able to be proven in the scientific fields we've talked about, you would have somebody from the government some way get all beside themselves over that. So it's a sad situation. But how many parents know about those things? And you say, well, they don't. But you know one of the big reasons why? They don't know enough to know they should. And those that do won't go poke their nose into it and find out. It's your children. They're training your children. They're teaching them. And yes, there was a time when most people came from the same moral background, moral principles. That's not anymore. It hadn't been for a long time. But you can talk about, let's don't talk about evolution and what I've said is my examples and say now we need to do in the class what we need to do and that is get back to the subject of the Bible on faith and grace and peace and love, etc. And so the child once again is made to feel stupid and ignorant because he asked a question we don't deal with. So once again, it's nothing more than a defense mechanism from a teacher who won't do what a teacher ought to do to be called properly a teacher. Teachers can't teach what they don't know. They don't know anything about that. It's a problem. But let me end on that by saying, parents, God put the teaching and training of your children first, foremost, and always into your hands. And that's, that's so important. I don't know how to say it otherwise. Well, I'm going to pause here, and we'll continue on with this. Lord willing next time around. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. If you ask me how I know the Bible's the word of God, we can go into a study of proving to you the Bible is revealed from heaven by God and proven to be the word of God, and that's important. And once we do that, from that Bible, we are building faith from the truths contained therein that God is. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only Savior of the world. That belief in Him and His gospel system is essential. One cannot go to heaven without believing it. Complying with the terms of pardon that our Lord set out in the gospel. And repenting of their sins, having once believed. Confessed their faith in Christ and then completed their obedience to the gospel. By being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, then you live your life growing and developing. And part of that is contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. If you need to repent of any sins as a child of God, we urge you to do that. We'll pray with you and for you. And do that now while we stand and sing.